from Finale Guitar in Sheffield and you're watching my channel Folk Friend, your one-stop shop for Celtic backing guitar tutorials. I had a lot of good feedback from my first video about the amazing Dennis Cahill, the ultra zen minimalist guitar player who plays famously with uh, Martin Hayes and The Gloaming as well as uh, others and so I've decided to have another little look at some other interesting things that Dennis Cahill does. I'm going to be showing you some examples from the same little clip we looked at before in which um, it's from slightly earlier in the same clip and Martin Hayes is playing a tune called The Old Bush. I just want to say thank you to my mum for always knowing the names of folk tunes. If you are looking for the name of a tune, uh, you don't need TunePal, you don't need the session.org, you don't need any of these things. What you need is my mum. So thanks mum, um, always smashing it on the tune names. Anyway, without further ado, let's have a little look at the clip of Martin Hayes and Dennis Cahill and then we'll have a look at analysing the chords that he plays and how he plays them afterwards. <laughs> leaves out the first part of the tune and just lets Martin Hayes play it on his own which for guitarists generally I think is really good practice um, if you hear the tune change and you're not entirely sure what the correct chords are going to be because maybe you've not learned the set in advance especially if you're playing in a session or something like that you know just let the tune run through maybe once through the whole thing so you can work out in your head where the chords are going to go and get a kind of feel for it Anyway, so Dennis Cahill obviously probably does know what Martin Hayes is going to play in advance because I assume they work the set out beforehand, but he leaves the tune to play through the A part once before he comes in on the B. However, I'm going to start with the A part because I think it's easier to do the tune in chronological order. 
So what Jen Lee Cahill plays for the A part is this little chord progression. Like that, and he repeats that throughout the A part. Now, I'll just show you quickly what these chords are. Um, the first chord we've got there is just two fingers like that. Um, you've got your middle finger on the B on the second fret of the A string and your ring finger on the A on the second fret of the G string. So B and A together, I mean that's basically a B7 chord or a B minor 7 chord. And I'm going to call it a B minor 7 chord because we are in the key of D mixolydian. So just to recap the music theory side of things a little bit very quickly, you can see on my mode wheel here, um, D mixolydian has D major or D7 as its root chord. Um, the main chords in a mixolydian tune are always chords 1, 7 and 5. So we'd have D, C major, that would be chord 7, and chord 5 would be A minor. And you'd expect them to be the three main ones in D mixolydian. The other chord options there, you've got, um, so going around in order, you've got D major, E minor, um, F sharp diminished, but we're going to avoid that one by using some sort of substitute. In this case, D with a thumb is a good substitute for F sharp diminished in folky world. Um, G major, A minor, B minor, and then C major chord 7, and then you're back where you started. If you don't know what I'm talking about by that, by the way, I have talked in lots of previous videos about why certain chords go in certain keys. If you look in the card in the corner of the screen, there are links to lots of my music theory videos which tell you how to pick chords for folk tunes. So check them out if you want to understand why certain chords go in certain modes, how to pick chords for folk tunes. So that first chord is a kind of B minor 7. Um, the second chord that he plays is A, the open A string with his, uh, well, in the case of Mr. Cahill, it's going to be with his plectrum because he always uses the technique that I talked about in the first video where he'll play the root notes with the plectrum and the upper strings by picking them with his fingers. Um, under his index finger then, he's got this note here, which is the C on the first fret of the B string. So that's something like that. A and C together, well, if A is your root note, C is the minor third, so that is effectively an A minor chord with just the root and the third in it. And then the next one is a C at the bottom with your ring finger on the third fret of the A string and a D at the top with your little finger. So C and D together, um, there are a few things that you could see that as, but if you listen to the tune, so the bit where the this C and D chord is goes da 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 something like that, and that's very much a chord one section because it starts on a D note, the first dominant beat of that little section da 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 da, so it's very much a chord one sounding section. And so this chord with a C at the bottom of it is quite an unusual choice for a chord one section. Um, however, it has, got, it has got the D note at the top of it. So what we're going to call that, it's D with D's flattened seventh at the bottom of the chord. Um, so that's actually a D7 chord, but inverted, so the seventh is at the bottom. So altogether, the first chord was B minor 7. Then we've got A minor... And then we've got D7, but inverted, so that the seventh note is at the bottom pitch of the chord, which is very unusual. The first chord, just to go back to that one, well, the tune actually starts on a chord five section. Da, 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 da. There's loads of A, that's a big long A at the start, and it ends on an A. Da, 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 da. And that other note's a C, which is A's minor third. So that is completely outlining... Um, an A minor chord, aka chord 5 in D mixolydian. So Mr Cahill's choice to put a B minor chord over that is weird, um, but it makes sense in context because what he actually does just creates tension because it resolves straight away down to an A minor chord. 
and very cleverly where this C note comes in which is the minor third of the A minor chord is where the tune is playing a C note so da 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 and there's the tune notes so he's kind of matched that up um, I think it's pretty clever da, 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 da. so yeah so the B minor at the start is only momentary the tonality of it is very vague if you played da, 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 that would sound rubbish that B minor sounds completely wrong there because that is just the notes of a B minor chord but because this is a B minor 7 with most of the notes left out of it it's very vague and fuzzy around the edges you know you could say it was B minor or you could say it was um, an A minor 9 with the notes flipped upside down so that the ninth is at the bottom. I mean, that's the great advantage of this thing of using minimalist chords that only have two or three notes in that Mr Cahill does all the time. Because often, if you leave the tonality vague, you can get away with more. I'll be coming back to that point in a little bit. Um, I've got some more examples of ways you can use that for other things. But um, yeah, it's really effective in this instance. So, let's have one more little look at that progression. So we've got a momentary B minor 7, but it resolves down to A minor, and that's covering the chord 5 section for the first bit of the uh, A part. And then the chord 1 section, he's played D7, but inverted, so the 7th is at the bottom. Again, very vague in its tonality, but basically covering the basses because it's got a D note in it, and it's got D seventh, D's flat and seventh, and as we said before, D seven is the first chord in D mixolydian if you're using uh, jazzy tetrads. Now at the end of um, the A part, you get this chord. So what that is, you've got an F sharp down the bottom with your index finger on the second fret of the bottom string. You've got your middle finger on the 3rd fret of the B string, which is a D note. And you've got your little finger on the 5th fret of the top E string, which is an A. So we've got F sharp, D and A. Well, D, F sharp and A, if they were in that ascending order, um, that's just a D major triad, simple D major chord. So he has ended the tune on a more definite D major to make the sections sound finished. However, it is more definite, but it's not completely definite because he's inverted it. So he's got the third note, the F sharp, at the bottom of the chord. Um, so that is kind of like what you're doing when you play your D with a thumb chord that I talk about a lot. Um, that's a D chord with the F sharp added in at the bottom with your thumb. And here he's done it like this, so he's got the fifth at the top uh, and the D in the middle. That's an interesting chord inversion as well because in these kind of minimalist chords the main notes that your ear is going to hear is the lowest pitched note in the chord which is going to pick up on first and then the highest pitched note and the notes in the middle you'll find unless you're good at ear training and you've done a lot of musical training and exercises to develop that you'll probably find you can't really pick out the middle notes consciously. Um, so the notes that the listener is really going to be focusing on in that chord are going to be the F sharp and the A, rather than the D. So although it is resolving back to a D chord, again it's very vague. Last little thing to say about this chord progression he plays for the A part is that one thing I mention in my book, Backing Guitar Techniques for Traditional Celtic Music, which is available now through all good booksellers, um, or more honestly through my website and through Amazon, Check that out, it's in the corner of the screen up there. Um, but one of the things that I talk about in that book is um, making little tunes within your chord progressions. Because if you think of a simple chord, a three note chord, for example, a triad, um, let's say you're playing G, then C, then D, for example, a very common chord progression. That's three chords of three notes in a row. And what another way of thinking of those three chords, aside from being chords in their own right, is as three little notes stacked on top of each other which make a little melody as they progress into the three notes of the next one and the three notes of the next one. So you could think of the three bass notes as one little melody that goes da da dum G C D 
Then you could think of the three middle notes as making their own little melody that goes B, E, F sharp. And you could think of the three fifths as making their own little melody that goes something like D, G, A, like that. Um, within simple chord progressions made out of just triads, those notes are always going to run parallel to each other. But within more complicated chord progressions made out of nice jazzy chords, where you've changed up the order in which you stack the notes within your chords, you can build chord progressions that make nice melodies within themselves. And that's what Mr Cahill's done here. So what he's done within this chord progression is made two little melodies, one in the bass line which goes... One at the top, which is going like that. Those two little melodies offset really nicely against each other. The one at the bottom is going um, one step down and then two steps up. So one step down, two steps up, up to there. And the one at the top is going, starting from there, going up two steps and then up one more. So where one is going down a step, the other is going up two steps, which is kind of nice contrary motion in the classical world. And then the top one goes up one and the bottom one comes up two. So they're kind of meeting each other in a way. And then at the end, we get this huge jump where the lower melody does a big jump downwards to the low F sharp. And the upper melody does a big jump upwards all the way up to the top A. Like that. That's just a general principle that you can think about if you're trying to use these kinds of uh, ultra-minimalist Zen chord progressions. Um, you want to think about the melodies that are made by individual notes within your progressions. Um, that's also just a general good principle for when you're thinking about using more jazzy chord progressions. Now I said I'd come back to the point about vague tonality. Um, this is a thing which once you know some interesting jazzy chord shapes will actually save you a lot of headaches with chords the way you play the wrong chord. Perhaps you play like a chord 5 in a chord 4 section or you play chord 4 where it's very definitely not a chord for resection or something like that. Well, there's a few ways you can make that sound like it was deliberate. Um, one of those is to use these types of chords with lots of chord extensions in them, like, for example, C major 9. So if I was in G major, I might use G major 7 to make my chords sound jazzy. And then for chord 4, I might use C major 9. And the reason I'd use C major 9 instead of a more standard C major is because a C major 9 is like a C triad, C, E and G. And then you've added the major 7th from C, which is B. And then as well as that, you've added the 9th, which is D. So within your C chord, your chord 4, you've got some ingredients from the other families. You've got the B note, which would have been present in G major's chord 1, which would be G, B and D. Um, and you've got a D note which is both in chord 1 and in chord 5. So what that means is if you do play it and you hit it right and it's a chord 4 section and you play your, your uh, C major 9, it adds a nice jazzy flavour to your chord 4. If you hit it wrong and you shouldn't have really played a chord 4 wherever you play it, it's plausible deniability because it's got some notes from um, chord 1 and chord 5 families. So if you play it and you're like, oh, actually, this isn't really a very chord 4 bit, you can then quickly switch up to a chord like um, either D7 or back to chord 1. And it'll sound deliberate because it sounds like you played a sort of jazzy chord to lead into your correct chord. But it had some of the right notes in it, so he obviously meant to do it. And you'll find these kind of chords will actually deliberately invagan your backing but make it sound nicer and get you out of a lot of trouble in uh, those kinds of situations. 
Let's move on to the B part. What Dennis Cahill does for the B part of this tune is really, really simple, but super effective and also quite weird. Um, so I'll just show you what he plays first. It goes like this. I breathe. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so what he's playing at the beginning here is effectively an E minor chord because you've got E as your root note right down the bottom and G, which is E's minor third, right up the top. And he plays that for the first bar of the B part. Now, the first bar of the B part is going... So if I was backing that, I would go in my head, oh, that's a chord five section in D mixolydian. And then back to chord one. That kind of thing. Nowhere in anything that I just played were there any E minors. Um, I would rarely ever play an E minor in D mixolydian, but Dennis Cahill does it right at the beginning um, in a chord five section. E minors not related to chord five. There shouldn't be any E minors in chord five sections, and yet it sounds fine. And the reason it sounds fine is because once again, with these ultra minimal chords, you can get away with a lot more. So in Martin Hayes's version of the tune, the B part starts on a long G note. Um, and then the main other note that's in that bar is E, so that's G and E. So um, lots of G and E in that bar, hence why Dennis Cahill is able, able to back it up with E minor, which is available in the key of D mix Lydian, as you can see on my mode wheel just there. Um, so he kind of gets away with it and it sounds pretty cool. And what he does is this really nice little seesaw effect, which is going back to the thing I was saying before about making melodies within your chords, which is obviously especially important if you're using ultra minimal two note chords. So he plays the chord that way round with the high G matching the first high G note, which is the first note of the uh, B part that Martin Hayes is playing. And then he just flips the chord up. So he's got the G at the bottom and the E at the top. And it sounds like it's a completely different thing Actually, it's the same thing, just with the octaves flipped. So... So all of that, where I would be playing chord 5 going back to chord 1, he's just stuck on an E minor chord effectively through the whole thing. But because of the ultra-minimalism of that chord, it doesn't really clash. And because of the fact that he flips the notes within it, it seems like there's some sort of sense of movement there. Um, and then finally, to end, he does the same thing that he did in the B part, where instead of resolving back to a straight up D chord to make it sound really finished, like it's gone home, he never lets tunes go home. He keeps them out wandering about um, for much longer than the average guitarist would. So he ends it on this um, inverted D chord with the F sharp at the bottom, the major third and the fifth, the A, right up the top. So it kind of finish thing, finishes things off more than they were before, because you have gone back to a D chord, but it's not completely finished because the main notes that your ear is picking out are the third and the fifth, so it's a little bit vague. These kinds of things like finishing on inverted chords um, and using very vague kind of chords will only work if you do it to all your chords. You know, if you were playing triads for most of the tune and then you suddenly flipped into one or two really vague chords, they would sound weird and fuzzy and indefinite in comparison to your very definite triads. However, if you do it with the whole tune, 
then just the tiniest little bit less vagueness for the last chord makes it sound more finished than it was and it lends the whole thing this kind of otherworldly quality that you get from listening to uh, Martin Hayes and Dennis Cahill. So that's about it for this video, I hope you've enjoyed it and found it helpful. If you have, hit the little thumbs up button down below, that really helps me out as well because the YouTube algorithm likes it and they show my video to more people, the more people thumb it up. As well as that, if you hit the subscribe button in the bottom corner, you will find that you get a free tutorial every week straight to your inbox from me. I'm also going to be releasing a series of play-alongs very soon in which I'll be looping tunes slowly played by my mother on the whistle. Um, they're going to be played at three different speeds and I'm going to be covering lots of session classics as well as putting up little chords on the screen that you can follow along with at home. I'm going to call them Carry Folky, which I'm sure you'll agree is a genius name. Drop me a comment in the box down below if there's anything else you'd like to see more videos about in future and I'll see you all next week for more Celtic guitar tutorials.